Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. And um, uh, just, just, just to echo what Maud has said about uh, Howard's book is that uh, one of the things that, when I, was a, when I was a kid, I wasn't really into a lot of fiction, Enid Blyton books and Janet and John books and, uh, and other kind of classic children's literature. I was never really into them. But my dad used to take me to the local, to our local library, and I used to always go for the sports section and read all the books on there, uh, a whole range of books on sports, football mainly, but also I remember reading uh, a great book about the Tour de France, about Tom Simpson, who, who tragically died on the top of Mount Ventura, or those people who went into the cycling. And, um, and so I've read a lot of autobiographies and autobiographies of uh, various sports stars and, uh, and sports people. And so when Maura says that this isn't your usual kind of autobiography, she's really, she's really, you know, it's dead right. Um, most autobiographies kind of um, a, a pretty kind of tame affairs where somebody will talk about, you know, some of the games that they played and some interesting, quirky anecdotes about uh, ex-players or managers or characters who they played with. But this is kind of a very different autobiography. And so um, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to ask Howard uh, uh, two or three questions, then I'm going to open it up to the audience and then I may come back depending on you know, um, what, the, what kind of questions the audience ask to, uh, to ask a few supplementary ones and so th there is plenty of time for people in the audience to have their input. But um, I think the first thing that uh, the first question I've got is that, um, as I said, most autobiographies, uh, are, you know, tend to be fairly kind of, uh, to be honest, dull affairs, and um, and this is different, and it's kind of part biography and part kind of social history. For example, I would talk about how would you talk about Liverpool's links with the slave, um, with the slave trade. And even, you know, uh, post-war housing policy. So the first question I want to ask you is, why did you approach it? Uh, why did you feel that you wanted to approach it in that particular way? Um, the, guy, the guy who also fought me, Simon Hughes, again, we, we, we used to meet on a, on a Monday or a Tuesday for a couple of hours, and I'd, I'd dictate him to the machine, and then he'd switch it off and just before we were going home. And, and we start talking about different things, about Liverpool, about the streets of uh, Liverpool, the football club, um, things that were going on around the, the world. And Simon said, why didn't you, why didn't you take this one with the, the microphone on? And we need all of this in the book. So uh, it, it took a long, a long time to, to compile. Um, ever since I, I, I finished football, I always Thoughts about an autobiography, but I've never really thought that that was sort of like me. Um, I'm, a, I'm a private person. Um, I don't like to talk about family or whatever within, within public. I try to keep that uh, on, on the down low. Uh, I've done some work with, 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 um, with Sam on a book called The Red Machine, and he done a chapter on me again growing up in Liverpool, and uh, it just seemed like the the opportune moments again now, after his group had been published, I said to you, would you mind helping me with mine and, and writing mine? And uh, as I say, we, we, we hit it off and um, he'd done, he done a lot of work. And, and again, as I say, what you will find about the, the book, those of you who will get it tonight and uh, who haven't read it, is that it, it's very well put together. Um, it can take you all over the place. And, and you can end back up on the same shows and you won't even know that you've been anywhere. Um, it's, it's, as I say, it's well written, well put together. Um, it just seemed like the, 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 the right thing to do at, um, at the right time. And then obviously, again, there was, there was things in the book that I found really hard to talk about um, and, to, and to put in the book. And it was such a go up until, the, the, I think it was the, the last three or four weeks ago, whether, whether we were going to publish it because there was, uh, there was issues over a, a certain person um, who I wanted named in the book and there was also also legal um, legal frails about whether or not we could have done it and uh, in the end again we found a way around it and as I say the, 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 the book um, was published in a lot of people who've, who've read the book again have said it's it's not 
you know, he say football is also biography. It has a, a, a lot of depth to it. Um, there is even again people who have been with anxiety with the tears, reading with with some of the stuff that that was in it. There was people who said that there was a lot of stuff that was in it who they could it, they could adhere to themselves, and um, they been through similar similar uh, issues going up in, in Liverpool. So on the broad or the the, the, the general feel about it is that people were, were pleased on how the books turned out and uh, I'm just hoping now that, that people read it and um, I'm, I'm always open to, to feedback on, and on anything that I do, um, whether it be positive or whether it be, be negative and uh, as I say on the, the, the negative side is last October uh, I rejected an MBE um, for my own reasons and the abuse that I got in, in the Echo on their website and you know, saying courses of, of Liverpool was, was unprecedented for everybody's attack to, to an opinion and that's just the way things are. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you've mentioned a couple of times there that, um, that you, about your book and uh, you've said that you're a kind of private person and there was issues of libel around it and it's kind of interesting that you say that because uh, I found, um, you know, reading the book, I found it kind of quite raw and quite honest. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's kind of surprising that you say that you're, you're the private person, but then there's a kind of rawness and an honesty to the book and uh, and the revealing of some, you know, some human failings of, yeah. of your own and that kind yeah. of stuff. So um, given all that, why did you, uh, I mean, this there's, there's, there's issue, let me just, I've just got to, you know, you highlight petty crimes, you highlight your four-month custodial sentence, you highlight, you know, uh, hooliganism, other things yeah. as well. Um, uh, what made you want to kind of reveal all of that, uh, all, of, all of those kind of details, um, given, given how private you are normally? I think, again, when, when, when we first sat down uh, to put the books together, Simon said to me that there are things that you wouldn't want to sell or say that you've got to sell. And for people to understand again who you really are, you can't leave the choice bits out or the bits that may be damaging. And, and you've, you've got to be open and honest for, for people to understand who you are and, and what the book is about. And that's what we always try to stick to. They, they were our guidelines and um, we never try to overstep the mark. We always try to make sure that a lot of, well, that all of the things that were in the book were factual. Mm. Um, and, and you would know yourself again, there's a lot of um, legitimacy that goes around again when, when you when putting a boot together and there's, there's things again that might might hurt people that maybe be things that are, are, are legally challenging which you can't use. And um, as I say, and I, I, I was in that place and uh, but I was bold again, I was again I was telling Simon again that the the issues again had to be resolved in, in a way that if they weren't resolved, then there wouldn't have been any book. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, both Simon and James, who was the owners of Cooperton, they were sort of like looking at me in a in a manner <laughs> to say, "You dare, you dare," because we've 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 gone the, we've gone this far. And again, when I when I first started um, putting the book together, the objective was was that I wanted to self publish. Um, I wanted to sort of like do it on my own so I, I could kind of like keep control of it. And as time went on again, Simon moved in to, to work with the Cuberton and um, he asked me again, would, would I be prepared to, to let the Cuberton publish the book? And uh, it just came at, a, at, a, at a, a time where I just thought that this was maybe the right time to, to move in this direction and uh, then when we did. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more question before we kind of um, open it up to the audience a little bit. And uh, I suppose it's really about um, the title of the book. It's called 61 Minutes in Munich. And um, obviously the impression that I got from the book is that uh, the game, that game in, in, you know, the famous game in Munich, uh, kind of defined your career a little bit and so I, I just wanted to kind of elaborate on that a little bit I know you, I can see you pulling your face there and yeah. it kind of uh, I kind of got the impression from reading the book that game kind of defined your career a little bit and I'm not necessarily sure that 
that's really what the, the impression that you want to give. Do you want to just say a bit about that? Well, for, for, for Liverpool fans or for football fans, those who can, who can think that far back, that's what they remember me for, was, was for that game. And, and going back to, to April of 1981, they were the times where most people remember the, well, every game in, in, in the Champions League now is, is, is televised, where most people will huddle around radios in Liverpool and um, I, 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 I could get it, I could get that in what it, what it would have been like because again, I've, I used to listen to Liverpool again on, on the radio but uh, I thought again that there's one thing that they told you that Liverpool is that one swallow never made a summer and my old mate Sammy Lee, he constantly used to say that he needed 250 games before you could call yourself a regular at Liverpool and um, well, I got nowhere near that but um, I knew that I'd done enough in that game I knew that every day that I trained and I played with world class players and from, from that level I knew that I was a good player um, I was always that again in a lot of things in life that maybe I wasn't confident about but when playing football again I was uh, I knew that I had things again and other skills that other players didn't have and couldn't live with, 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 uh, with me. Um, aggression uh, wasn't a problem, speed wasn't a problem and skill wasn't a problem. It was something again that you, you, you grew up with on the streets of Liverpool and um, it, it, that, that game in itself again I thought that, that I'd done enough in the game Whereas the staff at Liverpool would have trusted me a little bit more, um, but they tended not to. Um, the game itself, again, it's called six, it's called 61 minutes in Munich because I was I was able to go into the Guinness Book of Records because I was the first substitute to be substituted, and uh, those those people who again who, who look back at that game and. And look at how disappointed I was when I, when I, when I was brought off because I, I still thought that I had a lot to offer in that game and uh, it was a gamble that, that Bob Paisley took and it paid off because uh, Ray Kennedy scored a few minutes after I'd been taken off and um, we scraped through with a 1-1 draw which took us to the final but uh, personal um, issues were, were something again that were always rolled backwards at Liverpool because it was always about the team mm. and that's why the, the club itself became a juggernaut mm. because it was never ever about individuals and and I suppose again Kevin Keegan would would, would pay, um, witness to that because again he was he, he was the king of Liverpool and he told the club that he wanted to leave and the club didn't stand in his way they went yeah well on you go and he was gone um, Fortunately enough for us, in came Kenny Dalglish and um, he just knitted that team together. So you, you went with a, a great individual and um, inherited a player in Kenny who was, a, who was a top team player and he just knitted that team together and that team was largely great because of him. One of the things was in the book was you talked about the culture of Liber the culture at the club where there was a, a very demanding culture from every, everybody was um, everyone demanded a hundred or a, a minimum of a hundred hundred percent from everybody um, and one of the things you said about it was that uh, you know the club themselves kind of seemed to fear change you know yeah. where change was something to yeah. be feared and and everything else. so how much of that do you think? Might have contributed to to eventually losing their position at the uh, at, at the pinnacle of English football as the you know but from the end of the eighties and into the nineties how much of that kind of fear of change or the way things had been done how much of that do you think contributed that if at all? Well, Liverpool always had a had a, had a, a, a policy of don't fix what's not broken. Um, Again, my opinion is is that I just think that both Hillsborough and Heysel it, it interrupted the progress of Liverpool Football Club. That team in 1985-86 with Barnes, Beardsley, um, McMahon, Aldridge again, they were a great team. 
they were a great team and they didn't get a chance to play in Europe. We'd have, we'd have, we'd have way more than five um, Champions League or European Cups now if, if that team were allowed to play. Um, I think the City itself suffered um, because we had a, a Tory government and a woman called Margaret Thatcher and again six or seven weeks after the 61 uh, minutes in Munich there was civil unrest in this in this in this city um, Maggie Thatcher and her government never forgive us for it and she was always looking for the big stick of how she can cane the people of Liverpool up Pop Hillsborough up Pop Heysen um, both of them she used the media and a certain newspaper in particular called the Scrub, which just absolutely went to town on, the, on Liverpool and the people of Liverpool. And we're only just coming out of that now. But I think that the, the fact that the, um, that team, or Liverpool being banned out of Europe, and again, all the other teams got three years, Liverpool got five. And it really, again, it shouldn't have been a remit. But she, she was looking for an excuse to, to bring down the people of Liverpool and, and these, these uh, two events I think offered themselves up to her where she went to town on, on, the, on, the, on the people and the city and, and I think it took us a long time to recover I think um, especially with, with Hillsborough people, out, people outside of Liverpool didn't believe us they didn't believe what went on that day and they believed what they were reading in the school and all the other newspapers. So people looked upon Liverpool and people look upon Liverpool differently now. They look upon Liverpool as to say, do you know what them scouts were selling the truth all these years? And I think that the, the, the Hillsborough as well as Liverpool, um, the supporters clubs, they've got a powerful lobby now. Because I think that other, other clubs now look up to what we've achieved um, over those 27 years. Uh, and the fact that we've been able to take on the establishment and gain the truth. I think a lot of, a lot of other fans now look at us with that empathy of, well, do you know what? We, look, we like to be with them. But one thing about them scouts is they stick together. I mean, just to echo that, I mean, you know, more recent examples are the, uh, you know, the walkout last season where, where in, and now it's kind of policy that you know twenty pound is the minimum you pay to go away from home. That you know that probably wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for fans sticking together and uh, all of those kind of things. So that legacy kind of still goes. Yeah, well, on. I think again, Liverpool fans again led the way, and, and you couldn't have had a better statement. Liverpool were two 0 up against Sunderland, and I'd left myself. I walked out, and by the time I got on Lodge Lane, it was two up. Um, the fact that it would be somebody that was one of my old clubs, yeah, I didn't mind so much. But um, but but, but the, the the message went right to the club loud and clear, and the, the club backed down from uh, from raising the ticket prices. And that wasn't about the away fans actually; they were raising the ticket prices, the season ticket prices for for Liverpool fans at home, and they were taking it up to I think seventy seven pounds, mm. which is again when you consider the amount of money that the clubs are getting from. Um, from the TV rights, I think that they've got to start now looking at, at, at how they can compensate the fans and give the fans a fair deal because it's a really, really expensive um, task to go and watch a, a football club, well, especially in Liverpool. Again, I've got an, um, a, a, a B&B by the ground and there was a, a, a young lady who stayed there a couple of weeks ago with her son and she came from Lincoln, she was a, she was a farmer and uh, she told me that she was going to pick these tickets off a, I, I, I think what a lot of Liverpool fans would do, those who've got season tickets or family cars are actually selling them on, yeah. on match days and making a few bucks. Well she paid, I think it was £300 each for the ticket for her and her son and I said, what? She said, that was the going rate, we couldn't get them any cheaper and I just said to her, girl, I said, even, even so, and you shouldn't be paying those sorts of prices. You'd have been better off right to the club and um, put yourself in the queue yeah. than be paying. You know what I mean? And it seems that this is a, a, a steady trend. So um, I think that the club has to get its, its, its head together um, because they are such a, 
huge organisation. Again, when, when Liverpool play at home, again, you can't get a bed in this city. Yeah. I know a lot of Liverpool fans who have to stay in Manchester, in Wales, and Chester, and places like that, because you can't get a bed in the city. So the, the draw um, of the football club, um, it's just again the, the fact that many fans think that the club are abusing this and they're taking advantage of it. And you can go and get a, a packet of crisps and a, a cart and a coke, and it's like seven pounds. And I, I always say to the staff, and this is a running joke, I always say to them, where's your balaclava? <laughs> hey, because you're robbing us. And, I, and I, that's something again, I, I, I'll say this to them all the time. And, and again, as I say, the, the staff there only there, there as a job. Because that's their way, but again, I just think that the it's like it's like, like maybe they're in a, a they're in a pool on a par with the likes of travelling on a train. Is when you go to London or you travel on the train again, it's extortion the prices that they that they charge because they know you can't go anywhere else. I've been brought up in a different way. Um, I always think that I was lucky the fact that I was brought up here in Liverpool. It may be about they being brought up somewhere else. Then um, maybe uh, uh, those principles that you talked about may have not affected me and I would have been like other people who who think that uh, an MBE, an you know, OBE, CB, whatever it is, it, is a god that's well, well worth while having. And um, for me again, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm really conscious about my own culture. And when I well, I've grew up and I've listened to, to my father and his friends being talking about, about Africa, and as, as, as now, as I've got older and we've all got access to the internet and we start to hear things that conflicted with what we were taught in school, then um, it, it kind of resonates with me that somebody's been telling me lies and they've been telling me lies for a reason. And the fact that I, I have this stance on, um, on, on empire is that it would be really, really easy for me to, to accept it and um, walk around with, with my chest stuck out. But for me again, I, I think about those, those, those poor souls who were, there was over a hundred million people thrown into the Atlantic Ocean in transit. In transit. Yeah. And again, as I say, when I, when I, when I knocked the, 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 uh, the MBE back, um, all the rest of it showed itself in the Liverpool Echo and around the country, is that I see people who are saying, well, why don't you move on? Why don't you forget it? Why don't you do this? And what I say is, every year, we, everybody in this country is expected to wear poppies for things that have gone on in the past. And listen, there are people who've been sent to the deaths for the wrong reasons, and I'm talking about I'm talking about black and white soldiers within different wars, um, different conflicts. But they're allowed to remember them. The, the the Jews again went through the Holocaust. They're allowed to remember it. But when black people talk about black history and the slave trade, we're told to move on, forget about it, think about something else. Why are you always looking back? And and, and this is something that really really ilks me. Because I think that as some say, I'd love it to be within within my lifetime, is that we were that we were given an apology for what happened to our ancestors, and and the ignorance again with 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 certain causes who who are in denial, and what I say to to to, to most people that I meet, um, trying to educate them is that everybody on this planet originated out of Africa. Everybody. And again, white people, again, as they've migrated north towards the little pole again, as I say, is that the, the, the pigments in the color of it again has changed because of the, the, maybe because again, because of the climate. And, but there's this denial that there's any link or any, um, any, any sort of family resemblance or ancestry between white and black people. Um, we're all the same. We're all the same deep down and again under our skill, but again, as I say, it's, it's, a, it's another argument again with, 
with race and with whatever again it's another it's another way to divide and rule us um, that's the common complaint about um, about colour is that uh, especially again with Africa again you look at the, the South African regime there was a pecking order there was the Cape Codes, there was the Indians, there was the blacks, there was the the mixed race, and there was a there was a, a ladder, but blacks were at the bottom of it, always at the bottom of it, and they're the indigenous people of, of Africa. So for me again, as I say, the, the there are no regrets of of, of saying no uh, to the MBE and uh, I said no for for me for my own principles, and again, this is, this is my choice. And what I don't do, again, is that I've got many friends who, who have uh, accepted their bees or bees, whatever, and I don't prejudge them. That is their choice. I can only, I can only go on how I felt. And the choice I made, I wasn't influenced by anybody. It was a choice that I made based on my own thoughts and my own principles. Well I, well, I don't think that I had a reputation for being that. I got sent off twice in my career. Once was at Liverpool because uh, we, I think we played Berry and it was a scouser. We went for the tackle, ball broke, jumped up, called me a nigger. Uh, again, my reaction was that it was just that. I just hit him and battled him. Got sent off. Went to see the gaffer on the Monday morning. Thought I was going to get along to the gaffer just said to me that that's what, that's what they're going to do to good players. If they can't play it, they do they want to do time, they just get your sense off or and after they were always at Newcastle to call the referee chief. Um got sense off, shouldn't have done, but I had to accept it. But being difficult again, no, I can look after myself on a football pitch. Um, I learned to look after myself on the streets of Liverpool because I was brought up in a predominantly white area and I had to face all of that at school and it was now that I had to fight or I became a victim. And my brothers quickly told me that don't become a victim. Yeah. And that's how I was, and, and that's how I grew up. And I'm like that today. Is that I've always challenged something again around race. I won't turn me back on it, yeah. whether it's to me or whether it's again within my company. And I've had people, oh no, I would be don't mean you, you're one of us. Yeah. Hey, you're the one I say again. I'm, I'm putting, again, as I say, I am the way I am. Um, a lot of people don't like me because I tell it how it is. Um, I don't try and dress it up. Um, I don't think that I could be passed. And I think that if you're honest and you're open, then people understand it a lot better. And you can get on with it a lot better. But if they're not sure and they feel that, well, I don't know what he's going to say. Or, and, and the club are like that now. Okay, the, the, the club have a, have a, a, a periphery of, of former players who do the hospitality. But they don't touch me because they know if somebody asks me a question about race, then I'm going to give the answer. And a few years ago, after Louis Suarez said what he did to Patrice Evra, when I first got phoned, and again, I think they came out at four o'clock on a Monday, I got rang by Radio Merseyside at eight o'clock in the night, and I gave a comment to say that I, I played in, in Spain and they use the word negra and the word negra again obviously sounds like the word nigger over there yeah. so i've gone for the boy over there when he's using and they're going oh no 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 negra means black it's black and i defended him he swallowed i said that again i think it may be lost in translation about what he said and whatever but i didn't know that he repeatedly said it so when it's repeatedly said then, then it does become nigger and I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't really back them up. The next day again, the club wore t-shirts to support them. And I thought that that was a poor. But there are, there, there are a, lot, a lot of players like that. And um, as I say, I, I do a lot of work for, for show races in the red card. And we do a lot of work, we do a lot of events at football clubs. And you don't know how hard it is to get black first team players to these events to talk about football, yeah. or sorry, to talk about racism. Yeah. They don't want to do it, because they, don't, they, they feel that maybe if I talk about racism, that means that, well, the next club might buy me, because I'm, a, I'm, I'm going to be a, um, I'm going to be a nuisance in the dressing room, because I'm talking about it. And all the players you talked about it, the likes of um, Jason Roberts, again, not in football no more, 
accepted an MBE. John Barnes, again, and I do a lot of stuff with John Barnes, he can't get a job in football, and you look at his experience and his profile, but because he talks a lot about race, then people won't employ him. But I just wanted to talk about, uh, I mean, Tony Smith been mentioned a couple of times, so we didn't want to lose the kind of question from here, from Vinny over there about, uh, about Tommy Smith. And just to give you a quick positive suite, Howard mentions in the book where um, probably the biggest person who confronted you on a regular basis was Tommy Smith. Um, and it's also mentioned in a uh, Dave Hill, a guy called Dave Hill wrote a book, for those who are unfamiliar with it, called Out of His Skin. And it was about, uh, essentially the book's about um, racism in football, but it uses John Barnes uh, as uh, you know, to build you know the story of racism in football about, it. and he speaks to, he interviews Tommy Smith in the book, and Tommy Smith, you know, re uses the N word quite liberally, and uh, and actually says things like, you know, he'd move if a black person came to live next door, he wouldn't let his daughter marry a black person, and that kind of thing. So we'll just kind of mention that in terms of um, uh, in terms of background to the kind of next question that I wanted to ask Howard, which was about. Um, the kind of what I describe as casual racism uh, during that period that you were playing, and uh, and it's been touched upon by the previous uh, the, by the previous speaker. So I kind of want to give I want I want you to give us a kind of flavour of uh, how endemic that was and what kind of impact would that have on the likes of yourself who's, who's trying to fit in, who's trying to get a first team, who's trying to play, get a, become a regular in the first team. You're trying to fit in with the dressing room banter and the and the culture of the or of the club. How difficult is that? Uh, and, and obviously, you can only speak about your own experience and uh, and so on. But how difficult was that? Um, was that situation having to face that on a kind of daily basis, walking into your workplace on a daily basis, while at the same time you're trying to, you know, get your head down, work hard, play well, get a new contract, get in the first team fitting with the rest of the lads in the dressing room? Well, first of all, just to correct you, I don't think that you can ever, ever have casual racism. I think racism is what it is. And you, you, you can't dress it down as well as you. No, what I mean by casual is the way that it was casually used all the time. That's what I mean. It was, uh, you know, it was on television. It was, it, I don't mean that it was, I don't mean there's, a, there's the same levels of racism, one of which is serious and others which are casual. I'm talking about racism in the way that it was liberally used yeah, but, and it was casual in the way that yeah, but um, we, we, all, we all watched the black and white minstrel that show kind of and, thing, and yeah. love thy neighbour and kind all of those thing, things. Yeah. Yeah. Jim I, Davidson, another one, I, yeah, that I, kind I didn't of thing. Find, I didn't find them funny, in fact I, I found them intimidating because I knew... We weren't allowed to watch it in our house. Yeah, yeah, well again as I say, I knew that next, next day when I went into school, all yeah. the kids, if they'd seen it, they'd be giving me what they'd just seen on the television mm -hmm. and I'd have to endure that and it would neither end up in a bad place where I'd end up fighting um, out of school for, for, for whatever reasons but I was always having to, to justify myself and in, in many cases again people knew that racism was a touchy subject with me and some of them used it to, to, to wind me up at, at Liverpool but, but Tommy Smith again, he was, he was a law unto himself. He wasn't just a racist, he was a horrible man. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the most influential people that I could say that I've met with inside that club was, was, was Eminent Hughes. And he was a great man. Um, he, was, he, was what a, he was what you, you, you would want a captain to be, who's seen everybody in the club as equal. Um, he, would, he would get hold of me and give me encouragement. Um, at times again, I got the opportunity to play with him. But when he died, Tommy Smith absolutely slaughtered him. Slaughtered him. And it was only because I think that Emlyn took over his captaincy. And I think he, he gave more in England internationals and he captained England. And Tommy Smith hated that. Um, the, the, the stuff that again he used to, he used to lay on me. It got to that stage where it, I was nearly, again, I was nearly out of Liverpool. I nearly just went to see Bob Paisley and said, I don't know. Again, I, I, I can't deal with this no more. But fortunately, again, me, me, both of my brothers had seen that there was something wrong. Um, 
in, in my own personality and that uh, I wasn't enjoying the work that I was doing. And, and for me, again, going to Liverpool was like going to a sweet shop at 200 quid, knowing that you've got all day suspended. Um, it, was, it was just a, an unbelievable dream to, to um, and dreams do come true. I'm getting an opportunity to be able to, to, to put on that red shirt and, and to run out of them steps in front of the cop again was, was again, it, 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 apart from, apart from my children, it's the highlight of, 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 of my life anyway. And nobody could ever, ever take that from me. But there were certain times again under, um, under the realm of, of Tommy Smith. And um, listen, Tommy Smith wasn't very well liked within the club. He was, he was a bully on the pitch. And he used to be my eye. Again, I grew up watching Tommy Smith again because he was hard and he, he got this reputation of, of being one of the hard men of football. And, and he played for Liverpool and he was my job. He was one of my idols. And that's what I call all of them today. When I see the likes of Cali and Chris Lawler and, and Ron Yates, I, that's my name, I call them the gods, because they're Shankly's babies, and they, they were the beginning. Where Liverpool are today, they were the beginning. They started it all off. And uh, with him, again, as I say, it, it got to a stage, and one day, I came to all of us and said, uh, what's up with you? And I just tried to play it off and he said, no, what's up with you? To tell him. So I told him what it was. And I'd already had this chat before, uh, earlier on in, in life when, when in school. And our kid had said to me, you've got to make a statement to I said, well, I'm going to make a statement to this. He said, our kid just said to break his leg. <laughs> in training. And I said, I can't do that. I said, okay, we'll do that. I'm going to get thrown off. But then we to break his leg. It's not going to look like an accident. It's not going to, I'm going to have to do it with a baseball pass or something like that. So, um, it was one November morning. And uh, the, the staff used to have a staff team every day. And as a young apprentice or a young pro, you didn't want to get on the staff team. Because that meant that you had to do all their running. And it was like, they just thought, like, walk through that way. So, about Bob Paisley, Ronnie Bernard, Joe Faye, uh, Tom Saunders, Ruben Bennett. Uh, some of them were in the 60s, but they used to play every day at, uh, at Melbourne. And you didn't want to get on the staff side. And <laughs> some of the things I think that they uh, glad to do. They go with toilets while they were picking the teams and come out after the teams were picked. So you didn't have to go on the staff side. So uh, anyway, I was on the staff side one day. Um, the mighty balls used to be like bricks. Um, I was a very, 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 very good striker at the ball. So the ball's come to me and I've smashed it and it's hit Tommy Smith on the inside of his leg. And he's jumping around now, what? You, nigga, you black, nigga, you just do that. And I just, I just lost it. And I just, to just said to him that, uh, I'm really, really comfortable when I'm here. When I'm, when I'm in Liverpool East and I'm, I'm with my own people and, and, and I've mentioned it in the book that one day again Bob Paisley asked me to move out to Liverpool East and I said why? and it's just sort of, it's just, his reason was that well you become a better player than to be, to be, to be uh, less worried for you but all my friends and my family when I finished training again although I lived in Mossley Hill I always came back to here I'd spend the day here and I'd go home and sleep up at night and, and that would be my path. This is where my people were. This is where I felt most comfortable. Outside of the world of football, I felt safe here. And um, you're right that, uh, that that lack of understanding and again, through some of the education that I've learned over, let's say, the, the past 10 years, some, like some of the, some of the, invents, the inventions that that black people have been involved in, like the Ford motor car. Again, we've always been thought that again that the, the guy who had, was, was what team with the, the guy who invented Ford motor car was a black guy, but he couldn't have a patent in America. So Henry Ford put himself up, and his name was run before Ford motor cars for, 
for years. Um, but some of the some of the some of the things that you have access now, and and you think to yourself, wow, you know what I mean? That's a black person who's done that. Yeah, we've always been demonised, whereas we've been we, we've never been good enough. Um, we've never been smart enough. We've never been clever enough. But there is a there's a there's a there's a video on um, on YouTube called Hidden Cause and it's absolutely brilliant. And I would I would I would advise anybody to watch it because it will give you the best of understanding uh, about 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 black culture and, and where it's come where it's come from and how much it's been demonised and suppressed. And it has and again Liverpool is it's got the oldest black community in Europe. It's got the oldest black community. It's got the oldest Chinese community. You can see the Chinese community where it's reflected in the city centre. But when you go into the city centre, you don't see many people like us working in there. And that's been historic. This has always been one of the highest unemployment areas in the country. And, and because of that, we've always had to have the begging bowl to, to get this and to get that. As a result of the riots in some people would say most probably one of the one of the worst things that, that could happen to the city was the riots. Because what happened is they threw crumbs on the floor and people started to fight all over the movie, well I'll have that, I'll have that, and I'll move out to there and I'll go in and I'll do it. Instead of us sticking together and, and for for us as a community to go to the governments and say, well, and sit down with the governments and negotiate on what could be achieved for us, is that we did we got an 11 million pound garden centre down on the dock road that didn't employ anybody from our community that was gone within inside two years and there's now just like a, a what's the name site, a dump site and next to that was, was it Pleasure Island was it? Again, nobody from this community worked in there so again as I say the riots again, it kind of like it helped in that division of divide and rule and it divided us as a community there's those that got and those that didn't. A lot of people don't don't, don't realise this or know this, but as, as a group of players again, he, he wasn't very articulate. So we used to take the piss out of him all the time. Terry McDermott used to slaughter them. And whatever went on in the, in the team meetings, because Bob would stutter and he'd use phrases like, honour that one, or they didn't, or you want to get him in there, and, and you want to make sure that you get behind him on that one, so that he goes on that one. And that's how we talk. And they come out of the team meetings, and that's and they go, what the fuck is he just doing something about But Terry Mack used to just take him off all the time. Uh, what does he do? Because he saw Terry Mack not long after that. But uh, he was a... Uh, he, he wasn't a man of, of, of many words. He had a great team around him. Um, I used to have a, I used to have a running joke with uh, with with my gaffer Roy Evans. I used to say to you, if you don't fucking watch yourself, mate, when the when the revolution comes, you're going to be the first one up against the wall. And even to this day, he just says to me, and I see Evo, is that wall ready yet? Um, <laughs> when am I getting it? When am I getting it? But that was the banter again that we had at that level. But I think again. What happened in Liverpool in, 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 in 1981 was uh, it had to happen here. Again, what people don't, what a lot of people outside of the city don't realise is that people came from all over the country to take part in those riots. There was a large contingent that came from Yorkshire, from the mining community, after what happened at Oldgrave, again, it was the year before, where the police battered the miners, they took set on the miners. And the police came from Yorkshire as well, and it was like a, it was like a, a it was like it must have been like an away game for them, because they were all coming from Yorkshire to fight in Liverpool. But the um, the outlining thing for, for for me was was that I would, I would I would hazard a guess that most all of those people within that club would have been socialists, apart from maybe Peter Robinson. Um, but the chairman, John Smith, he always used to pull me aside. Hey, I'm from Topsit as well. He was from here, from Park Road. So, uh, Carly was from here as well. So there was a, 
I think there was a socialist view within, 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 within football, but football had a lot of issues that it was having to deal with, and this is where a lot of people uh, get it wrong. Go ahead, answer it then. Yeah. <laughs> football, football does more against anti-racism than governments or any, any, any social party, any, um, any local council. Again, it does more within its own ranks. Um, racism is a problem of society. It's not a problem for football. What football did in the 70s and the 80s, it gave the racists, or it gave the hooligans, the, the platform to, 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 to escalate it around the country and around the world. And then um, Heysel was a, was a product of that. And again, the truth came out again about ISIL. I, I went to that stadium uh, the year before, and I had a trial there for, for Bruges. And that stadium there was 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 it was it was it wasn't fit for the football game. Yet alone, they want to play a Champions League game there, final. It wasn't fit. The pitch may have been, but the terraces for 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 the fans and that wasn't. And we seem to again be getting the same story about Hillsborough. That Hillsborough didn't have the right safety certificate. But again, the game was allowed to carry on there. 96 people lost their lives. And the government, rather than hold an answer and say, well, this could have been our fault, they blamed it on the people of Liverpool. And uh, we've suffered because of that. But for 27 years, we've had to try and dismantle how people thought about the people of Liverpool because even the Blue Noses used to shout and then even again a few weeks ago they shot murderers to us and when the son Margaret Thatcher and all of their tools went into play for, for what was a, a campaign against the people of Liverpool not just Liverpool fans they used the word scousers so that included the Everton fans as well. And it wasn't maybe until, until that happened that I think the blue side of the, of, of the city realised that we're all in this together. And that common unity then married itself um, across the park. And I think that we are, I think that we're a unique people here in this city. I think that we're passionate about what we do and we're loyal about what we do. And that's why, again, as I say, you, you don't get many people who will switch from Liverpool to Everton or from Everton to Liverpool. Once you're a blue, you're a blue. Once you're a red, you're a red. Unless you're a blue. And you'd end up playing for Liverpool like Jamie Gallagher, Mike Steve McMahon, or Rush Unit or the next with, with, with those four names there. I sometimes, I sometimes wonder that if a club was to employ a black manager, that a black manager will bring in predominantly black players and maybe that the club don't want that to, to be their image. Um, football is trendy. Whoever wins the World Cup, everyone buys their players. Whoever wins the European Championships, everybody buys their players. Um, you just wonder, you know, you're just waiting for a, a black manager or a, 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 well, it has to be a black manager to be successful. Then. Every club will want one then. Hey, hey them, hey, them blacks can believe when they can achieve, so hey, let's, let's get one in here. Hey, and, and maybe that they will bring some black players with them and make our club a little bit better. And um, for me again, and, and again, what, what's the, again, what the gentleman just said there, again, is right, is that modern day game is based on pace. Black people, again, we're born with that, it's in our DNA. We're born with the agility, with pace, with power. And if you've got a team that hasn't got it, then you're going to struggle. And right now, Liverpool are in that mould. We're, we're, we've not got enough pace in that team to get behind or to worry. And again, and with the loss of Mane, who was our talisman, is that we're struggling right now. We're going to struggle to, to, to remain in, 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 the, in the champions, sorry, in the in the top four. Well, if you look at a lot of the mediocre teams who've adopted this, the likes of Bournemouth, 
is that you see that now that they're not just above the relegation zone, they're caught on the top, the top, the top 10. Because they've got pace in the team, another team that hasn't got pace in the team just being relegated, Sunderland. And I've got a son up there, and I've been telling them for years that Sunderland have been dodging the buzz, and sooner or later it's going to get them because they've got no pace in the team, and they've got John O'Shea at the back who's too slow, and he gets found out every week. And Sunderland have just got the, they just reserved, so they've got relegated, and they keep changing the manager. So again, they keep buying bad players. As you know, Howard, my missus is from Sunderland, and yeah. so my, my father-in-law is. So, got a, so my question, he had a question for me to pass on to you, which was, what does Sunderland need to do to get back in the top flight? And I think you just kind of answered it. <laughs> no, well, do you know what? And the other thing he said, he said, why did you leave Sunderland? So um, uh, the other question he asked was, why did you leave Sunderland so... Lolly, 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 Mac, my enemy. Mm. He was the reason why I left Sunderland. He, 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 he knew that I knew more about football than him. <laughs> um, both me and David Hodgson, because we, we had that upbringing at Liverpool. We knew what good players was, and that's what he used to do. Wherever he went, he used to surround himself with the likes of uh, Southampton. It was Alan Ball, Kevin Keegan, all the old heads who he didn't have to coach. They worked out for themselves. He tried to do the same thing when he comes to Sunderland. He bought six players, tried to divide the dressing room, and it didn't work because the, the, the players were looking at him and going, well, come on, show us something here. What are you, what, how are we going to play? And there was no pattern, and he nearly got relegated. Um, what he did was, he, um, he sacked me, well, at the end of the season, we, we played Stoke on the, um, on the Saturday. And we won 2 0. We needed to win to, just to, to guarantee it. We won 2 0. He took me off with 10 minutes to go. And I just gave him a dirty look and walked down the tunnel. And uh, the, 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 the reporter must have said, well, that's, that must be the end of Howard Gale. Here. So on the Monday again, we're all sat downstairs and um, we're all waiting in line to go up to see him. But I'd already been into the boot room and cracked all my boots and all my gear and that, because I knew that this was the end. So I've gone upstairs to see him in, in his office and he's there, uh, his son, there was a lot of snides around the club at that time, a guy called Luke Chatterley and his son, and uh, his son had rang him up to say that our guest standing outside your office, and his son didn't know that I was already in his office and I could hear this. So um, well, my enemy said, uh, where are you going? I said, what do you mean? I said, well, I've heard that you've packed your bags and whatever, and I said, well, are you going to be giving me another contract for you? He went, no. I went off and walked out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I knew, I, knew, I, knew, I knew that we were going to um, get a, uh, uh, another contract because we were too much of an influence in the changing room and, and, we, and we, we'd argue our toss um, with Lord and Matt and me. But there's a, there's a common complaint with a lot of clubs who share derbies um, I was in Birmingham a few weeks ago at, at Birmingham City and I said to the, to the fans that Birmingham is, a, is a, a massive club that spends far too much time worrying what Aston Villa are doing and Sunderland are exactly the same with Newcastle. The last year again, Sunderland came, Newcastle for going down and what goes around comes around. They've got exactly the same thing. This, I mean, this season, but Sunderland can get beat, but everything's all right as long as Newcastle get beat. Birmingham can get beat, everything's all right as long as Aston Villa get beat. And I'm saying to them, you've got to be thinking bigger than this, than, than your neighbours. Again, that's just a derby that comes around twice a year. You've got to be thinking to yourselves as a big club, how can you be bigger? How can you start winning trophies? How can you get in the Premier League? Me and sustain your status there. But the, there was a what's the name? Um, Birmingham played Aston Villa a few weeks ago, and I have a lot of Birmingham City fans on my Facebook. And one of the Birmingham City fans had, had put, We're going to try and get all the Aston Villa fans and the Birmingham fans to sing You'll Never Walk Alone because it's a, it's a unifying song. And 
we need to, and, and they were singing it based on the, um, what had happened to the Birmingham Six. Oh, that's that's what it was. And you know, Birmingham City fans saying, I'm not fucking, fucking scouts, I'm not singing their song. There's no way we, we're singing with Aston Villa. And I'm thinking to, you, I'm thinking to myself, and I went off Facebook and I said that some of you aren't getting this now. You're going to sing the song of a club that's got most probably one of the most powerful lobbies in football and who can maybe help you in that desire of anywhere that you want to go with the Birmingham Six. They just weren't having it. Nah, we're not having that. There's no way we're singing with the, they call them the Vile, instead of the Villa. So there's no way we're singing with them. And it's the same everywhere again. And, and, and again, Everton are exactly the same Tribal. with Liverpool. Tribal. The bitterness towards us and, and, and what we are and, and what we've achieved, instead of Everton thinking to ourselves again, hey, listen, we've got a good team here. Let's forget about Liverpool for a couple of seasons. Let's see where we can go with this. There has been a petition against our new stadium, Howard. Pardon? I just thought I'd mention that. There's what? There has been a petition against our new stadium, Howard. I just thought I'd throw that in. A petition? Yeah, there's been a petition. Did you know about the petition? I started it. <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago, again, I was in on the, on the, 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 on the loop. And I know that there was a meeting that involved Liverpool City Council, Joe Anderson, Liverpool Football Club, Everton Football Club. And Ken Knight came into the meeting and the council said that we'll put 50 grand in, Liverpool put 50 grand in, and what we'll do is we'll get a survey done, ground whatever, to see whether we can ground share both clubs in Stanley Park. Ken Knight said, can you two put 25 grand in for us? Because we can't afford it. And Liverpool just said... 25 grand? Yeah. Liverpool just said no. It's the boot man's wages. No, no, yeah. it. Liverpool just said no. But there was a... There was a I think there was again... There was, and, I, and I think that... I think now seeing the stadium, I think it was like, but I thought then, the best thing that could have happened to this city is that we built a purpose... a, a purpose built modern day stadium that would facilitate both clubs. I think that there are always things that you remember or, or come to light because of a, a process or because of, of a discussion. And uh, as I say, one of the, the biggest issues that we had in, in publishing the book, again, um, up until four years ago, I wasn't having this. But I was sexually abused at school by a teacher. And again, when we go back to the MBE and you talk about establishment, I see the education as part of the establishment. And education let me down because there was, there was no complaint system. I couldn't sell my mother because it broke her heart. I don't know what my dad would have done because my dad just wasn't a man of reasoning. I know that both of my brothers, when I went up that school, killed the teacher. I know mm -hmm. that. I know that. And I couldn't sell them either. So I had to, I had to suffer this for. It's, it's, it wasn't until maybe three years ago that I told my partner because she was going through a, a tough time and. I just thought by telling her this is something that would, would help her through some of the difficulties that she was going through. Um, I had to sit down with me, me two older brothers and, and tell them before, um, before the boot came out, before, because I didn't want them to read this in the boot. And there was anything that I needed to alert them to, it was my brother and my sister again, I did. And even then when, when I told them, I broke down. And again, I'm, I'm, I see myself as emotionally again, quite strong. I'm not a, a crier or anything like that, but I, I broke down, telling them, and I could see the anger in their face. But I knew that if I'd have told them, I knew what they'd have done, because they were very, very protective of me and my sister. And that, that type of thing again, and, 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 and it, it was right. You know what I mean? People think that, that 
paedophiles are just somebody you make the paper every every now and again. You know what I mean? They they they, they, they live in the monsters. And again, as I say, I was like I was like forced to go to church by my father every every, every Sunday, and he didn't go. When a priest used to come and knock around here around our house, my dad would be on the toilets until the priest did go. But he made me and my sister go to church every 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 day. My mother was a Protestant. So when the Orange Lodge used to come round, my mum would be hanging out the window, yeah, singing all the all the songs. And um, and, my, and my dad would be fuming. But um, there was there was stuff that went on in 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 school that was was horrific. There was there was a nun called Sister Gerard and some of the stuff that she did, I seen her one day. There was, a, there was a, she didn't like anybody laughing, and I seen her one day. She uh, she calls a, a girl laughing, and uh, call a girl out to the front, and the girl said that I mean it, it must have been a funny joke or whatever, and whether it was a nervous laugh. As she's walking to the front, she still got this grin on her face. So the nun said to her, "Hold your hand out." So the girl went like that. She went no and turned her hand over to that side and came in with these rules that broke all of her fingers. It was horrible. The screaming was horrible. And, and, and this was a nun. This was a nun. And I you used to think to yourself, well, these people are supposed to be people who were, who were, who were telling you nice things and, and offering up all the, 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 the glory of what, of, what, of, of and what God is. Yeah, compassion but, but and this woman was everything else. She was and she, and she took pleasure in what she did that day, and and I and, and, and I could never ever I could never ever forget what, what she did, and, and that girl's the screaming of that girl, and she didn't stop when the screaming started. She carried on, and it was it was it was unbelievable, and these are the things again that you, that you would that you would have to deal with in in a in a, in, a, in a Catholic school. So again, as I say, as soon as I got the opportunity, where I didn't have to go to church no more, I just stopped it. And um, that again, that that was that was my choice, based on a lot of the experiences that that I've had. Again, my father sending me sending me to church, and, and I go to church and look in the chair, see what colour the, the priest had up, and I'd be I'd be going I'd go and play football for an hour. Um, until church is finished, and then, then I go home. And uh, my dad caught me one day because he uh, he asked me what colours the the uh, the priest was wearing. That's what he used to do because the, the priest used to wear a a, a different colour every, every every week. And um, I sold him the wrong colour. So my dad's trick was well, you can stay here, and the next time you can go out will be mass next week and um, my dad again giving us items was was hands you could take the items it was the staying in I mean because it lasted forever and you could hear all your mates in that outside playing football kicking it against your fence right outside your house looking for you against the lamppost and everything and um, um, I couldn't even go and stand by the door I had to watch them from me upstairs my bedroom window with me with my hands on the on the window ledge like that just Thinking to myself, I'm going to church next Sunday. <laughs> again, me, me, da, me dad used to say that um, a lot of cases again we used to sit down and he said that, pardon me, all the people in Africa, they think that the streets of Britain are paved with gold and that's why all the Africans want to come here because um, there, was, there, was, there was way again. You can't beg in Africa. You could you could beg in Africa, and it could take you two weeks to get twenty pence. Mm. And I mean, you can beg on the streets here, and you can you can you can you can, you can earn a, a, a nice living on the compassion again of people. But um, after my dad died, uh, I went to Sierra Leone um, to his old school, um, and I met the, the sports minister, and he offered me the job, and. I said to you again because I'm, I'm always weary again about being set up. So I asked him again, why have you offered me the job? Again, what you've got to do, the right process to do is to advertise the job 
and interview and get the right candidate. You don't know what I'm going to do with you. You could give, put me on a, a three-year contract and I might be crap. You, know, you can see the background of where I've come from. Um, they obviously see me coaching. But you can't do that. But do you think again, um, I don't know why it is, is that a lot of the, I think, I think that Nigerian I was the only one who... who Stephen Keshi was yeah. for the time, yeah. and I think they've gone back now to a European manager. I think so, yeah. Because it, uh, hmm? it's... It's Sunday Lise manager is now. He's, yeah. a, he's a Nigerian legend. Yeah. 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 And, and, and that's what it needs, it needs Roma, it needs Africans to go back home. To, to, and I've, again, I, I, I say this again with, with, with Barnsley, again, why wouldn't you look elsewhere to maybe get that bit of experience? Because it's, as I say, it's like trends. Once you, you, you're successful and people see that you've, you've got that winning mentality, is that they tend to have a little bit more faith in you, to have that investment in you. But we've got this, this trolley hanging over us that, well, do we really want to be giving him a hundred million to be going spending it on, on players and what sort of players is he going to be bringing in? And if they're all black and we have to go back to the bare parts of white, are we going to get all the black players out of the club? And this is the mentality that that, 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 that football clubs have. And many years ago, when I played for Blackburn Rovers, the chairman there was, was, was a guy called Bill Fox. Now, Bill was like, he was like, on the FA committee, he wasn't just law source like a chairman. He was he was he was high ranking, and I remember saying to him one day, I said, "You know what, Bill? If you get an Asian player in here, somebody from India, to supplement again the 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 community that you've got, you put another seven thousand on the gate because Indians will come in um, because they've got." Uh, an affinity, they've got, they've got an, an identification with the team, didn't see, said nah, didn't see, didn't want, didn't want that. Well I think that a lot of Asian players have suffered in the same stereotypes as what black players did and I know some really good Asian players, some kids who were good, who, who, who I would think given the opportunity would be able to, to, to make the standard of at least professional football. Yeah, but there should be more. I think there's a couple of lads who were at Leeds and Bradford again who are now coming it's, it's through. It's kind of them. interesting the um, Asian sports stars in general thing because I think I think you're right. I think you're absolutely you hit the nail on the head about about the kind of stereotypes. But I think those stereotypes used to exist in boxing yeah. till a long time until people like Nazim Hamid and Amir Khan kind of changed the perception of Asian boxers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> To, to a large degree, and I think, um, I think, I think you're right about the kind of stereotypes. The, uh, the stereotypes are they're not physically fit, or yeah. they're, they're too scrawny. Yeah. They're not into football. They're kind of into cricket. Uh, those kind of um, those kind of stereotypes yeah. kind of still exist. There, I think, amongst Asian. Players. Yeah, I think the first is, is the first and second generation of, of, of again of, of Asians who were, who were growing up in the UK is that. Uh, the, the, there was a lot around culture that was stopping them from playing football. Obviously, again, the, the, the mosque, the prayer, the, the, the lifestyle again. Again, a lot of them were working in their own family businesses, and that came first rather than football. So sometimes, again, the opportunity, the opportunities presented themselves, but the player himself or the person himself wasn't right or wasn't ready to, to step up or, or to take that challenge on because of family, because of culture, and um, within the Asian community again, family always comes first, rather than, sorry, rather than anything else. No, well, again, I was brought up in Malice Green, and again, playing football up there again, being the only black kid in, in, a, in a white team, meant that I became a, a target, but I also became the focus within, within the game, because I was the only one. Anything that I did was noticed. Um, and, I, and again, I was good. Um, the first thing I learned to do when I was young was, was learn to use my left foot so I could use both feet. Um, this gave me an added advantage again because I had natural pace, is that I could go left, right, I could cross the ball on my left, right, which other players were inhibited. Um, I moved down to the south end 
and I started playing for the timepiece on a started standing out first. Then I played for my brother's team, the timepiece on a Saturday, and I played for the Bedford on a Sunday. Now the, the guy who was manager of the Bedford, he being going up to he knew somebody who lived by him, a guy called Johnny Benison, who was a coach at Liverpool, and he'd been going on to him for months, for months, for months. You've got this kid, you've got to come and see him. He's only he's only 18, he's playing against adults and he's tearing in the back out of it, playing in, in, in Prince's Park. And uh, Benno didn't believe him, but Benno just said to you one day, I'll bring him up. And they used to train at, at Melwood on a Tuesday and a Thursday. That was the, the requisite to the, the academy where the Probables again played the Hopefuls and um, the game that, the, the, that, I, that, I, that I played in. Oh, but you little mate, you've got ants in here. <laughs> um, played the Probables against the, the Hopefuls and I picked the ball up outside my own box and I beat about five or six players and on the run I've hit a shot, it's hit the bar before it's bounced I've volleyed it in the top corner and as I've turned now and I've looked and I'm looking at all the staff who were all nodding with approval and I mean they must have liked that sods of all is, a couple of minutes later I went over on my ankle and twisted my ankle but they seen that I tried to carry on and again, there was this stereotype that black players were soft. And they see that, uh, that I wasn't. And eventually, again, um, I think Bob Paisley said, to the so come off, again, you, you've done enough. You're going to do yourself more damage and try to, try to play on that. And they give me the, the time for, to recover and to get fit. And then it, it starts to snowball because, again, the next performance was just as good. Uh, they introduced me into the game against another club. Um, then the progression was to, to take me from there to train them full time with the pros. And when I heard this, I was going to be training with, with all my idols and the gods again. It didn't get better. It didn't get any better. And I was I was looking forward to that time, and I was going to be able to, to run out in front of the, in front of the cop. Um, being a, again a Liverpool fan and. I'm, I'm, I'm living on the cop. Uh, growing up there, it was it was silly, and uh, I think there was an element I was good enough for. I think there was also an element of luck with it. And I think there's luck in anything that we do. I think that it would be it would be great for the for the continent of Africa if uh, if one of them were to, were to win the, the World Cup. But you don't need. The only, the, only, the only nation that would win it, I think that football, in the 70s and 80s you may have got a fluke. You won't get a fluke now. Because your players have got to be playing in the top leagues around Europe. And have that, that top level of coaching to be able to, to, to manage a, a, a World Cup. And I'd be, I'd be very, very hopeful. Uh, you, would, you would see, or you would have to see, Possibly a full squad of players who were playing in the Italian League, the French League, the, the English League, the Spanish League, and the Dutch League. Mm. And that's where they get. Once, once you see that, then you would see that there's likely what is is that here's a nation here, and it, it would be one of the, the bigger nations. It'd be Nigeria, um, Cameroon, Cameroon, Cameroon South, South Africa. I mean, go on again. Yeah. One, one of those. It won't be somebody like I wish it would be somebody like Sarah, you know, but never be anybody like that. It's, it's interesting, um, you know, we, we don't get a sense here about how big football is, actually. Um, I, was in, I was in Nigeria in 2002. There was a, there was a nondescript friendly game played at, I played at uh, QPR. It was live on yeah. nine different channels across yeah. Nigeria. Yeah. It's, you know, so it, just a kind of indication of what would happen if... Uh, but I think they'd have to be... You know, like the way Belgium have got a crop of players at the moment who, uh, who seem to have all kind of come together at the right time and are playing in all the top leagues. Something similar would have to happen with, yeah. a, with an African team, I think, for that to happen. It's something, again, that, that, that I've looked at myself of, of maybe taking coaches to Africa to coach education. Because, again, there, there are a lot of coaches who are really, really good coaches, but they're religious. And, and in many ways, again, this holds them back. But I think that there's ways around that. 
I think there's ways around that. And again, a good coach is a good coach. A good teacher is a good teacher. It doesn't matter whether they teach it out of a book or whether they teach it out of practical. If they can get that message across to you that you learn, that's a good coach and a good teacher for me. Well, I think, I think again, they've, they've took their players from the French colonies in Africa. And that's what makes it easier because, again, for, for nationalism, it's really, really hard to come out of Africa and play within Europe. It, it, it's, 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 it's non-existent, really, again, for the player coming out of Africa and playing in the UK or playing in the, in the Premier League. And there's a man there who's a football agent, so we'd be able to tell you um, a little bit more about it. But the, the difficulties that lie, again, is, is, is really, again, not on ability. It's about qualification and whether you've got the right paperwork to be able to, and what a lot of, what a, a lot of clubs do now is there are a lot of clubs who've got um, academies and camps in, in Africa. They bring them into your, into clubs where it's... Stephen scary. Pina is a good example. Yeah. You know, at yeah. Ajax had a, an academy in South Africa, that's how Pina was, uh, was discovered. Yeah. yeah. In Italy, for example, there's been, there's been uh, stuff around that as well. Um, I think one of the other things, is just to add a dimension to that whole issue, is that a manager is, uh, is also the public face of a football team um, and gets asked about a whole range of stuff. So when, uh, I don't know, we had recent sex scandals, didn't we, you know, of, of you know, historical kind of issues around you know, academies and young players. Well, every single manager uh, was asked about, you know, every single Premier League manager would have been asked about about that. So, so <coughs> managers get asked about a whole load of things that are kind of outside their sphere of influence and outside their kind of job description because they're the public face of a club. And one of the issues is, do you want, you know, a black guy to be the public face of your club and having to kind of answer all kind of, uh, um, obviously football related matters, but also matters to do with the club that aren't necessarily related to football as well. I also think that maybe because of the colour or the shade of your skin will make it easy for you. I think that Chris Halton at Brighton, because he's of, of mixed race origin, is that that's made it easier for him to make that, that transition. Do you know when the beginning of the end was for Liverpool? Gerard Hulia. He started bringing in French players and it's only the fact that we still had players who were coming through the ranks, Fowler, Owen, Gerard, Carrigan, they were coming through again. That kind of like saved us and got it through. But when you look at Liverpool's team now, it's, it's for the first time, it's unidentifiable. There are no scouts in that team, apart from Trent Alexander, or when he gets in. I cannot believe, for the life of me, why they would retire Steven Gerrard. Steven Gerrard, about after the, the, the legs point, he's the best passer of the ball in that Premier League. And they've, they've retired him and he's coaching the kids. And I'm thinking, I'm watching that game yesterday, and I'm thinking, Steven Gerrard's playing in this game, we're going to win this. But they've, they've took him to a place where it's a game, he's managing the under 20 degrees, he's still relatively young. If Pilo was playing international football at 38, then why can't Steven Gerrard play Premier League football at like 35, 36? I mean, I, mean uh, I think that's a good, I think that's, um, I mean, AC Milan for years have had, you know, high quality players who they've looked after, you know, the very best in kind of medical care and kept them playing, you know, Seedorf, uh, what's his name, um, Maldini played yeah. for, until he was gone 40, uh, there's, 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 there's Seedorf's yeah. obvious one, there's, there's others as well who did the same thing. Just on the uh, thing about the academies though. I just think that if you give a 17 year old kid, you know, four grand a week, 17, 18, I, I just think it's ridiculous. You know what I mean? Because. No, I, just, well, I, I, again, I disagree with you, Louis. Because at the, end, at the end of the day, you can give your child a 20 pound note. It's how you tell your child to use that money Absolutely, and how yeah, to spend yeah. it. And but they've got agents and all of that kind yeah, of but stuff. Again, you, listen, no. that is never going to go away. Once, yeah, something, yeah. once something happens, there's no way that the they're, going to, the they're, 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 they're going to be shafted. But for me, again, and I, I go on record, I would stack 11 scouts against anybody. Yeah. Again, as I say, we're the special people here. We've got it in our DNA. We're winners. Our kids have been brought up as winners. They've watched winning teams. 
That's being instilled in them through the families, the generations, the granddads, the fathers, the mothers, whatever. You're told about your club and you understand the history of your club and, and, and what it is like. Whereas some of them players, they don't get it. Some of them players playing for Liverpool right now, they don't get it. Um, the one thing about the likes of Barcelona, they buy players that are Barcelona players. They don't buy you because you're good or you're great or you scored 50 goals or whatever. They buy you because you fit into their way of playing. That's what we used to do. Liverpool, Liverpool were the architect of the passive move and the rest of the rest of Europe followed it. But now again, what the club are doing, we're looking now to see what other clubs are doing and copying them. Yeah, well again, one of the, the, the common thoughts that I have watching academy football is that it's breeding players who can't think for themselves. And I always think, I look at Steven Gerrard, Wayne Rooney, Jamie Carragher. If you're all streetwise off the pitch, it means you're streetwise on it. You can make decisions for yourself. Whereas a lot of footballers now, they're always looking over to the bench, what shall I do now? Shall I do? No, okay, yeah. mean, and, and, and you can see the managers and say, uh, and the managers are buying into this. I'll be thinking to yourself, well, I'll say what I'll do. I'll drag you off, mate. Hey, if, you, if, you don't, if, you, if you're playing professional football and you can't think of a game and game manage a, a situation for yourself, then what, what are you doing playing football? Hey, I may as well just again, put an earpiece in you and tell you where to run, and that's where it'll get to. It'd be like the question, the question, the question, that, the question that you asked about, um, about, about women, I think that we're 10 to 15 years of women playing in the men's game. Right now, again, as I say, the men's game is virtually no contact now. Anytime you touch a player, he's falling over and he's rolling on the floor. So again, the contact is steadily going out of the game. That will introduce it into, um, for women. I was at a, um, a, a trade union in, in Leeds a couple of years ago, and a woman asked me the same question. She, or she asked me, what's the difference in equality? Why the men's game, they throw money at it, the women's game, they don't. And I just come back at it and said, you've just asked the wrong question. You should have been asking, why can't women play with the men? Not where they're getting the money from, because there's never going to be two conglomerates where they're going to have a women's league where they're paying the millions, or the men's league that they're going to pay the millions. What they're going to have is you're going to, Anna, there's a, there's a, there's a young girl who I coach in the school now, her name's Khadija Dibbo. Hey, what's your name? Because I tell you what, this girl is top draw and she will make it. And again, as I say, she'll get all the support and, and all the guidance again from, you know, from, from her parents and also again from a community. Because again, it says in that book that I was the first black player. And when I see some of the kids and the talent around here, again, it amazes me of how I was the last one all of those years ago, how we haven't produced somebody else and I know that they're here it's all about opportunity for them and the clubs come in here Everton and Liverpool again come here and they do coaching this and coaching that they don't put nothing back into our community but they take our kids um, I've got a little list here and it's going it's to be it is the final question uh, yourself Tony Warnier Tony Warner Lee Peltier John Oksemapo Victor Anichibi Cliff Marshall all local black kids who played for our local teams. Why Trent, Trent, Trent Alexander, Darling, Arnold, which you just, who you just mentioned, who were left off, left off the list. Uh, that's what half a dozen or so. Um, and considering what you said about the football talent and, 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 and interesting discussion that, you, that we've just been having about the women's game, is that there's loads of talent coming out of... Um, you know, we've got uh, an England international from this area playing for Man City, Nikita. We've got other footballers kind of coming through, and I think well, that's going to happen. If you know again about Nikita, she spent all her childhood on the Astor yeah, yeah. playing with the boys yeah, yeah. every day, and that's how she learned her, her game. <coughs> and she's as good as what she did. I think she got the young player of the year. Got the young year. player of the year last week, yeah. So. The question is, we've got half, we've had half a dozen, considering, considering the amount of talent there is, and also, 
you know how um, how important football is to this community as well. Um, when well, we have I, was, I was say to, to how important the football is to the city. To, exactly. And, and, yeah. Yeah. As, yeah. As, absolutely. As, yeah. As a whole. As a whole. And I just yeah, think that Liverpool right now has, has lost its its identity. All of its great moments and its its glories over the past thirty years has always come with at least two scousers in that team and the game that I watched yesterday, I know that if Carragher or Gerard or if, even if Ad had been playing, is that there would have been a lot more a lot more Agency. effort and a lot more passion towards towards getting the results. And when I watched Liverpool yesterday, they looked like eleven Academy players to me. Who just didn't have a clue themselves and passed the ball pass the book and if Coutinho, Coutinho doesn't do it or Firmino doesn't do it no then, do then it. we struggle and we're always vulnerable at the back. Okay, um, there's just I, one thing that I would like yeah. to say there and, and listen and again this is on film. I just hope that nobody takes from this that here's Howard Gale and all he's been doing is talking about, about white people because some of my best friends are oh, white people. I've got, <laughs> I've got children to 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 white to, to white mothers, and again, some of the some there are some people who I absolutely can hate who are black people. Yeah. Okay, so again, there, there, there isn't there is this is this isn't a a, a, a white people forum again. This is just an, an open discussion based on a lot of the the life's experiences that that I've had. Okay. So.